Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for being here today. Good morning, Senator. Um, I have a number of concerns with the way the President continually overreaches his authority. And something that really concerns me is the executive actions in this upcoming rule proposal by the Social Security Administration to include folks who have fiduciaries uh, into the NICS program. Um, this is certainly not clarifying existing law. Uh, this would prohibit them from the constitutional Second Amendment right, not based on due process, but only on the fact that they requested a family member or friend to assist them with their finances. I'm concerned with your department's final ruling that revised some of the definitions regarding being adjudicated as a mental defective and committed to a mental institution to now bro more broadly cover folks who seek treatment. Uh, I'm concerned because these were not changed through Congress and now you couple it with the upcoming uh, Social Security rule, uh, you know, what are we going to have? Please tell me what your department's plans are here. What is the Social Security Administration planning to do and who will be entered into the NICS based solely on Social Security records? Senator, thank you for raising that important issue. Um, as you know, the current Gun Control Act does prohibit individuals um, who have been adjudicated in certain ways involving their mental health from possessing firearms. Um, and currently, under current law, federal agencies are required to submit information to NICS if, about individuals who fall into those categories, involuntary commitment and adjudications of the type that, that you were discussing. Uh, the Social Security Administration is beginning a process of seeking comment through a rulemaking process in order to clarify who within the Social Security Administration adjudication system should also fall into that category as well. For example, well, not, not, I'll withdraw that, it's not an example, but they currently are not providing the information. And so the, the questions that you raise are very real and salient ones. And uh, the Social Security Administration's process, which is just beginning, is designed to, in fact, solicit comment, get input as to which types of adjudications should in fact be provided to NICS and which should not. Because as we know, the issue of mental illness is not one that subjects every individual who has that issue to a prohibition from exactly. obtaining a firearm. Um, and so it is, it's important that we clarify, as other agencies have, which types of adjudications and which types of issues would require those records to come to NICS. So the Social Security Administration is beginning that process. And certainly we look forward to providing whatever input and guidance they request from the Department of Justice on that as well. One of the things that will of course be part of that um, is as with all of that, for example, our VA, our VA already provides records. Um, but one of the things that will be part of that process is making sure that any individual Who's, who may find themselves in that situation receives notice that that is a possibility. Uh, that is something that would be consistent with existing law and the Second Amendment. And also that there is a way for an individual to apply to have their rights restored, not just to um, own and possess a firearm, but anything else that might be a collateral consequence of a particular type of adjudication. At this point, I can't predict for you what types of adjudications the Social Security Administration would decide should be provided to the NICS system, but we certainly look forward to them going through the comment process and refining that area. Good. Well, thank you, because that really is a real concern. I've heard from a number of police departments in Arkansas who've had equitable sharing funds recently removed from their accounts uh, due to the Department of Adjustments, uh, Justice's mismanagement of the budget. In a letter from your department dated December 21st, 2015, regarding the asset for forfeiture, uh, program. It states that DOJ has already begun implementing cost reduction measures. What are the measures and when do you envision the equitable sharing program to be reinstated? Can you explain the benefits of this program to the American people? I say this because it is an important program and, and we're so concerned about violent crime. This is one of the tools that we're using uh, very effectively uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, decrease that and fight that battle. Yeah, well, thank you for the question, Senator, because I share your concern and also our regard for the strong working relationship that the federal government has with our state and local counterparts. Certainly as a U.S. attorney, I was a direct beneficiary of their talent and their expertise. And now as attorney general, I, I do all I can to keep those relationships strong and vital because they are essential 
uh, to protecting the American people. With respect to the equitable sharing issue that you've raised, um, with res there have been some budget issues there. There was a rescission uh, from the department's asset forfeiture fund made in the last fiscal year. I don't know the exact time of it. And that essentially limited our ability to provide funds pursuant to equitable sharing. Uh, we are looking forward to restoring those payments as soon as the receipts to the asset forfeiture fund allow. We very much feel that equitable sharing is an important law enforcement tool. I know that there is a great deal of discussion about asset forfeiture in general. We have been working with Congress to make sure that we retain this important, this important aspect of it while also addressing those concerns as well. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Bob.